know, it, it, we hear a lot of things about Islamic fundamentalism in, in the media as this, you know, great boogeyman. But what's really interesting is compared to how much time is spent on talking about it and, you know, bringing it up in, 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 in every single day, we never really hear where it's coming from and why, you know, how it's kind of formed. It's always portrayed as some kind of murky, obscure thing that just spontaneously erupted amongst, uh, you know, Arabs, basically, or people in the Middle East, is Muslim people. Uh, but and that's a really good question. Why is that so? Why are we never told where did this phenomenon come from and how did it develop? And the truth is that, well, very uncomfortable for the people, the ruling class, in, in the West because, you know, even if you look at today, for instance, this morning I, I hear they went, were going on and on again about uh, a, um, a, a, a assumed chemical attack in Syria against uh, Idlib, which is a governorate that's under, that, that the Syrian regime, you know, allied with the Russians are attacking at the moment. And, you know, we're, we're told that this, uh, that the people who have power in this, in this area, in Idlib, uh, you know, freedom fighters, rebels, moderate rebels, whatever that means. But what we're never really told is that these people are effectively, that whole region is effectively controlled by a branch of Al-Qaeda, uh, you know, which, which has got many, many different names over the time, but which is essentially a branch of, of, of Al-Qaeda. Uh, for many years, in the beginning of the Syrian civil war, we were always told that what we have here is a is a, is a, on the one side we have the brutal Assad regime, we, are, we agree that's a very brutal regime, and on the other side we have these freedom fighters. And of course this was true to begin with, but at a certain stage this movement uh, became, became sectarianized and was hijacked by Islamic fundamentalists, uh, by the same people who you know, later suddenly became known to everyone as ISIS and who were suddenly the, the worst boogeymen in, in, in the world, but they were there all along, supported by the West, supported by the allies of the West in the regions, by Saudi Arabia, by Turkey, by Jordan, uh, and, 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 and the CIA, who, who had an operation in, in, in the country. Um, and, and, uh, and even, uh, you know, if we go to Afghanistan today, there are negotiations. We never really, you know, they don't talk about it in the news, but at the moment, U.S. imperialism is in negotiations with the Taliban to secure a withdrawal for, 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 from Afghan, Afghanistan, essentially handing power or you know, sorting out some kind of a power sharing deal with these, these extremists. I would say that more or less at all stages, Islamic fundamentalism as we know it today has been tied <coughs> to imperialism at all stages of, of, of its development. From the first days of the modern Middle East, uh, the, the main form of counter-revolution has been one form or another, in one way or another, connected with, uh, with, with, with Islamic fundamentalism. That doesn't go to say that all Muslims are Islamic fundamentalists, but that this is a political movement, it's a counter-revolutionary political movement uh, that at all stages has been propped up by, by, by the imperialists and by the most reactionary forces in the region. Even if we go back you know, just after the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, by the, after, when the when Turkey was uh, was known as Turkey today, was um, occupied by by Western imperialist powers, you had the uh, Turkish War of Independence, which was essentially a bourgeois revolution, uh, led by Kemal uh, uh, Atatürk, Mustafa <coughs> Kemal Atatürk, and which was fighting a, a struggle against uh, the, the, the imperialists. Who, and what was the imperialist's last card, what was the last card that they played, was this old sultan, who was basically a British puppet, nothing more than that, uh, who, who used his uh, <coughs> formal designation as a caliph to call for, a, for, a, for an uprising against this, this movement, trying to reach out, trying to connect with the most backward, reactionary layers of, of, of Turkish society against the Ataturk movement, which wasn't leftist in any way, but it was revolutionary and it was a break, with a complete break with the, with the, 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 the backwardness of, of the past, trying to um, modernize Turkey, trying to bring it into uh, a, 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 new, uh, a new era. 
And we saw that, that the bourgeois revolution in Turkey, and what we'll see throughout the history of the Middle East, that the, 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 the main task of the, well, the, rev the revolution can only take place under the banner of secularism, right? the division of, of state and religion. And this, that's just like, uh, well, more or less just like it happened in, in, in Europe, but there's a big difference in that um, this time, a strong capitalist powers do exist. So this is not like the Enlightenment period, you know, the, the rise of the capitalist class in, 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 in Europe, which was fighting against the Catholic Church. This time there are actually more powerful powers in Europe, which are already developed uh, capitalism, and which do not have an interest in an independent, strong capitalist society uh, developing in, in, in the Middle East. And that's the reaction, that, that's the, the, the irony of the whole thing, that you have the European bourgeoisie coming to power, fighting against obscurantism, against uh, you know, religious fanaticism of the Catholic Church, and in the Middle East, they are forced, well, they are not forced, they, they, they lean on uh, these exact type of, of uh, forces, and lean on the most conservative uh, layers and classes, even classes going far before, to, you know, who, who are established and who belong to eras which are far before uh, capitalism, in order to dominate the region. European capital had no interest in developing uh, an independent, you know, strong capitalist Middle East, insofar as, as, um, as they did help the development of some sort of capitalist class, this class was completely tied to the old order. It was basically the big land, uh, big land landowners, aristocratic, you know, one form or another, or, or of aristocratic and tribal people. Um, and, they, and these people were completely tied to imperialists. They were completely tied to the old uh, regime, to the old order in society. And they were completely incapable of developing society in any meaningful way. And they were hated by the masses. Um, and at the same time, the empire, the Ottoman Empire after World War I, was broken up and divided uh, in the most humiliating way. And the Arab nation in particular was divided up in exchange between the big powers like, you know, like a change in a poker game or <laughs> something like that. Um, and these people who all share a common history, you know, there's, there's not a difference, at least before, there wasn't a difference between people living in what's known as Syria today, or Jordan, or Palestine, or Lebanon. This is the same tribes and peoples who, are, you know, who lived across of these borders. In fact, if anything, the imperialists made sure to cut these up and make sure that they are divided up as, as many different groups in each nation in order to keep them weak, in order to be able to divide, play them up against each other, uh, in order to, 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 to rule them. Um, and, and these people who, you know, who used to live side by side for centuries were divided up and split up like cattle, basically. And this humiliation and this betrayal left a mark on the psyche of the Middle Eastern masses, which is still there uh, today. Um, and the, humili the, 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 the oppression and the humiliation of imperialism was obviously the source of enormous anger. Uh, and immediately after World War I, you saw that the, the, the general crisis in society, the general t turbulence in society, opened the way for a whole series of national liberation movements uh, everywhere. Uh, Im immediately beginning from after the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the World War I, especially in Egypt, there was a revolution against the British, which was, which was, which was defeated. But everywhere you saw, in, in Iraq, in northern Iraq, in southern Iraq, you saw uprisings, mass movements, against imperialism, for national self-determination and, and liberation. And in general, you saw um, uh, uh, yeah, widespread radicalization. But, as I said, the, the capitalist path was repeatedly blocked, basically, by, 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 by the imperialists, by the, by the so-called, by the, by the ones who were, in fact, capitalists in the region as well. And therefore, you saw actually the, the development of, of movements which even went further and further and further to the left of, of, uh, of, of capitalism. You know, starting off from just uh, basic democratic demands, they would get more and more radicalized, moving to the left. To the left. <coughs> and here, Egypt was a key country, especially because it's, it was the most uh, developed uh, country at, uh, at the time. Um, yeah. And in Egypt, you have this, um, these new cities uh, developing with layers of industrial workers for the first time, although it was a small working class, but 
For the first time you had industrial working class, you had the beginning of an urban intelligentsia, urban middle class uh, intellectuals, and top state officials who were being radicalized in this situation uh, by, the, the, by the desire to develop society, basically, and being blocked every single, uh, at every single step. And at the same time, you had, on the other hand, a, a pull from, from, uh, of, of, for a, a Marxist uh, or leftist uh, perspective, in the sense that the Russian Revolution where the masses, the, the, the workers, the poor, and the peasants had taken power in their own hands was, a, was an enormous source of in, inspiration. Um, so while you had people you know, being blocked from the capitalist path, you had the Soviet Union becoming this example to follow in the eyes of millions and, and, and millions of, of, of people. Um, now, in Egypt, imperialism, imperialism was seen as a massive impediment for the development and modern, modernization of, of, of Egypt. And that was the main driving force, in fact, especially amongst the middle classes. You know, they, they wanted to have some sort of national dignity and development and modernization of Egypt. That's, well, that goes for every single country in the Middle East up until this day. Um, but they couldn't because they were, because they were faced with this uh, imperialism. Now, at the same time, you had also another layer developing which is what was called in Egypt the Lower Effendia, I think it's, it's pronounced, which is a layer of newly urbanized uh, village dwellers, often people coming not from, not from really poor background, but from medium, basically middle class, medium landowners, who are not the enormous big landlords who have ties to the imperialists, who have direct ties to the state, but the medium ones which are being outcompeted by the state, by, by industrialization, uh, and who feel the pressure from the rising cities who are, becoming, who, who are coming to dominate the villages. Um, they're under pressure from the economic crisis and the pressures of, 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 of imperialism, and they're losing their independence. You know, these are people who, who had a traditional position in society before, like kind of village heads, people would go to them, ask for advice about you know, all kinds of things, like who to marry and whatnot. People would go to ask, you know, to get uh, uh, to borrow money from them and get advice from them if, if they had economic problems and so on. They had a certain social stature which was being undermined by the development of capitalism, by the uh, inroads that imperialism was making. And they couldn't really, um, um, they, they, they couldn't see any way out. These were the most conservative layers of Egyptian society. If they stayed in the village, they were constantly on the verge of bankruptcy. Imagine. Like every single day thinking you can lose everything basically. Not just, you know, and it wasn't people who didn't own anything. They actually had something and they were losing all of it. And at the same time, if they went to the cities as well, they would be ruined because in the cities they didn't have the connections to move up. You know, they might be able to get a, a job as a teacher or a lawyer or a doctor, you know, the lowest, lowest layers of the middle class, but they didn't have the connections to the big landlords, to the imperialists and so on to move up. And they, so everywhere they went, they felt this hatred uh, uh, and this humiliation, and they longed for stability and for the rehabilitation of their own positions. And they were, you know, they, they were dreaming of a return to the, to the good old days, which is always what the, what the conservative petty bourgeoisie does, being under pressure from all sides. You know, they, they can't understand the working class uh, and the, you know, the communists, and obviously they can't deal with the, with the big uh, bourgeois either. So they kind of dreamed their ways back to this old society where they had a certain, uh, uh, a certain position. And it was amongst this layer that the Muslim Brotherhood was formed in Egypt in 1928 by Hassan al-Banna. And the ideology, obviously there's lots of different uh, you know, uh, parts of it, and it is, it, it is a developed ideology, but basically, uh, from our point of view, what it re represented, from a class point of view, what it represented was a return to the early days of Islam, kind of a revivalist, Puritan uh, 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 view of society. Um, and that became a, a, a focal point for this layer within the cities and also the conservative uh, uh, layers which were in, in, the, in the villages as well. Nevertheless, the Muslim Brotherhood was not the dominant uh, force in society, the dominant movement was still to the left. Like you can see, uh, not even you know, it doesn't didn't have the, actually the Communist Party in Egypt made many many mistakes and wasn't 
ever, it did, didn't ever really grow to become a mass force. But you had all kinds of organizations instinctively, you know, pressured by events, uh, basically moving to the left and taking on a more and more socialist, Marxist, uh, leftist rhetoric and ideology. Um, but as I said, the Communist Party didn't manage to capitalize on this mass movement to the left which was especially after the defeat of the 1919 revolution, you saw you know, very, very big radicalization, people saying, you know, that, you know, this is not enough, we need to break with the whole, with the whole thing. But as I said, the, the communists didn't have, it couldn't take uh, 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 advantage of this, and therefore the mass movement on the streets, and there was a mass movement developing, lacked organization, lacked a political focal point. And so this vacuum was filled by a group of officers led by Gamal Abdel Nasser, who, which was called the Free Officers Movement. And they staged a coup in July 1952 against the, uh, the Farouk regime. And Farouk was a king who was basically a puppet king uh, of, you know, controlled by the British. And the reason why, well, the, the character of this movement, of this, of this officers movement, was you know, these were people who were deep within the state apparatus. They were high within the military. And therefore, they could see all the rot, they could see all the incompetence. In 1948, <laughs> they lost the war against, you know, all of the Arab nations lost the war against Israel, which was based purely on, you know, on, on the incompetence of, of, the, um, of the ruling classes and the deals that they were making with different, with different imperialists. And they could see all of this, and they, they wanted to rehabilitate their nation, basically. Uh, they also had a higher education, they had access to education systems in Europe, and they had a, a higher cultural level in, a sense, in, in essence. And therefore, and also they were organized as one of the only organized forces in, 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 in Egypt. Um, and they took power, and initially Nasser was not a socialist or even a leftist. In fact, just after taking power, he cracked down on a communist-led uh, uh, massive uh, textile strike but he was a nationalist, and Nasser wanted to restore Egypt's honor. That was basically the, the main driving force uh, of his, his rule, in, at least in the early days. But in doing so, so, he would increasingly come into conflict with Western imperialism. And he would incre in increasingly find himself leaning on the Soviet Union, which for him also was kind of a model which was appealing. Here you had uh, a military-run society, I know democracy, there's one guy from the top that decides but also a society which had managed to modernize itself from you know, extreme backwardness and barbarism to being the, the, the uh, second power on the planet within a, you know, within a very, very short period of time. Um, and you saw him drifting towards the left um, and taking on a, a, a left-leaning Arab nationalist, uh, Arab socialism, socialist point of view. Uh, and he became a focal point throughout the whole of the Middle East for all of the movements developing uh, in, in, the, in the whole of the region and even beyond. Uh, now, this, this movement was radicalized again in 1956, where, uh, where uh, Nasser, because of conflicts with, with the British, ended up nationalizing the Suez Canal, which, which was built by, by Egyptians, which was run by Egyptians, and the only thing that was not Egyptians was the profit of it. And Nasser wanted to use the profit from the from the dam, from the sorry, from the canal, to modernize Egypt, to industrialize industrialize Egypt. Being blocked by the imperialists, he nationalized it, and then he was um, he was attacked by a, a coalition of Israel, France, and Britain, which he defeated. Again, this this uh, this further pushed him to the left, radicalized not only the movement, not only the the the, the, the mood in Egypt, but, but throughout the whole of the Middle East against the imperialism. I guess imperialist and further uh, to, to to the left. Now Nasser actually, he was he was never a Marxist or a socialist. He, he didn't have he didn't implement socialism, and that was his mistake. In fact, in fact, if we have to go and uh, you know study the mistakes of you know what has led Egypt to where it is today, it would be because Nasser never finished what he started. He nationalized uh, the main industries in Egypt. And by doing so, he, he developed the free healthcare, free education, the railway network. In fact, you go to Egypt today, nothing has built, been built since Nasser's time. And that says something about, uh, about Egypt, about Nasser. 
but he still maintained the, the, the old bourgeoisie, the, the bourgeoisie maintained, remained, and capitalism wasn't, in fact, um, uh, uh, overthrown. Um, nevertheless, he moved far to the left, and in doing so, he, became, he came increasingly into, conf into conflict with the Muslim Brotherhood. And the Muslim Brotherhood, as I said, was, you know, it represented these conservative uh, religious layers who were not interested and who were, who were interested in maintaining uh, the power of, of uh, you know, had this revivalist basic ideology and had an interest in maintaining the, the, the power of these layers which were being undermined by Nasser's industrialization. Uh, uh, these middle class layers, sexy bourgeois layers in the villages, in the cities, and, and, and so on. So whereas in the beginning, Nasser actually gave the Muslim Brotherhood positions within the regime, top positions within the regime, like Sayyid Qut, who were like the main ideologue, ideologue of, of the Muslim Brotherhood, had like top state positions. Um, but as they came into conflict with each other, he started to crack down on it. And that, that actually radicalized the movement from being kind of a conservative, bright conservative movement to becoming more and more extreme to going more and more into uh, terrorism and into like you know armed struggle and so on. Um, but nevertheless, Nasser was in no mood to share power, and his extreme popularity meant that him cracking down on the Muslim brother and destroying them, essentially destroying them, didn't really uh, sh uh, cause any anyone to complain, uh, or you know it wasn't at least not, not that many people. Um, yes, now. Nasser at that point was the most popular man in the whole of the Middle East. Uh, but that was because he, reflect, he reflected a general movement which, which was being seen everywhere. Uh, and this process actually went further, for instance in Syria, it went even further than in Egypt with a group of officers taking power through a series of coups, moving to the left and, and actually nationalizing everything, completely expropriating the bourgeoisie and essentially uh, getting rid of capitalism as, as we know it. You had left-wing developments in Iraq, in Libya, in Yemen. There was the same type of movements uh, developing. Um, and you saw the Soviet Union gaining influence as the British were, were losing out. And, and the Soviets were stepping in and filling uh, th this vacuum. And this terrified the new world power, US imperialism, and obviously also the ruling classes of the region who were, who were really you know, terrified of, of where this whole thing was going. The, the king of Jordan, the, the kings of Saudi Arabia, the Gulf states, and so on. Uh, the Americans, in fact, tried to convince the, uh, the Iraqis to attack and invade Syria, which, which was the country, as I said, which had gone the furthest. But the whole thing collapsed, and, and, and in fact, like within a few weeks or months, Iraq was in the middle of a revolutionary uh, movement itself. And so, from, from the military path, the Americans realized that uh, they needed to take the political path. They, they needed to prepare the political ground for counter-revolution. And, and, and the main architect of this was the uh, US uh, Secretary of State, John Foster, Do Foster Dulles, who saw the, the role of political Islam, who saw the role that religion could play in galvanizing uh, a layer of people, galvanizing movement to fight against uh, these, these things. Um, and he found a, a partner in, in, the, in Saudi Arabia, which well, I'll explain later, but, um, and actually he was petitioning the Saudi king for, for waging, you know, for calling for a jihad against the, the Syrian regime and so on, but the Saudi king at that point said, we cannot do that, we cannot go against these regimes publicly, because the movement was so strong also in the uh, Arabian Peninsula. Now, um, now, this, now Saudi, Saudi Arabia is a peculiar nation because in many ways it's, a, it's an artificial formation, at least it's a formation that wouldn't last as long if it was just left to itself. It's, a, it's basically based on a, 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 an alliance of a clan, the Al Saud clan, and the Wahhabi clergy of the uh, uh, Sheikh Al Sheikh clan, uh, I think it's called. Um, and the Wahhabis who have this extreme Puritan form of, uh, form of uh, uh, Muslim ideology, they, were, they basically made a power sharing deal, whereas the king and, and, the, and the Al Sauds basically control the state, and they're the king and they control the, the main leaders of the state. 
and the, the Wahhabis form the ideological arm of, of that state. Um, now, this probably could survive you know, for a very, very short period of time if it hadn't been by, uh, due to the support of first British imperialism uh, in order to have a foothold in the region. And later on, the Americans who used the, the Saudis and the Gulf, uh, the Gulf states <coughs> on the one hand as a political counter, tool of counter-revolution, but also later on as a source of oil as, as we know it. Um, now, the Saudis uh, were terrified of the movement that was going on, that, of the development that was going on in the region. Uh, they had taken in many of the Muslim Brotherhood uh, people who had been escaping e Egypt, and they have been helping to maintain the network of the Muslim Brotherhood in uh, the whole of the, of, the, uh, of the region. There is only one problem in that, uh, oh, and just to say that, you know, this activist kind of organizational side of the Muslim Brotherhood, they have found kind of a common ground with the Wahhabis, and this basically strengthened both of them. I radicalized the, the Muslim Brothers, uh, but also gave the Wahhabis a more organizational, political uh, kind of character. Now, the fundamental problem in in Saudi Arabia, in the Saudi regime, is that uh, on the one hand you have the ideological arm of the regime calling for, the, for a caliphate, for an Islamic state, for, uh, which does not have a king. And on the other hand, you have this, the same country ruled uh, as a kingdom by a king who also uh, is no secret, does not live in any way as to prescribe by, 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 any, by, by, by Islam. And certainly not that the, the type preached by the Wahhabis. Um, and therefore, they, these, these groups increasingly came, they came into conflict, conflict many, many times. But throughout the 60s and the 70s, this became worse and worse. In fact, there was at a certain time in 79, there was an uprising where a series of, of um, Islamists took over the, um, what's it called? The Grand Mosque of Mecca. It led to several hundred uh, dead people. But this, all of this were warning signs to the Saudi, uh, Saudi uh, royal family where this whole thing was going, that they were actually faced by uprising internally, a right-wing reactionary uprising against themselves. And so they made a deal with the Wahhabis, which was basically, if you just leave us alone in Saudi Arabia, we'll give you tons of money and every help and everything we can abroad, helping you set up schools and, and, and so on uh, throughout the region. And this fell in hand, hand in hand with, uh, again, the, the aims of US imperialism, which was looking for a base of support to counter the leftward drift that we saw in the region. And the first time that this was tested was in Afghanistan in 1979. Uh, and it started in 1978, in fact, in the Sour Revolution, where similar to Egypt, a group of uh, army officers, <coughs> left-wing army officers, took power in Afghanistan and um, uh, immediately implemented a whole series of, uh, of, 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 of things, such as banning the buying and selling of women, canceling all debts that the poor peasants had to, to landowners, expropriating 75% of land which was held by, by the big landlords, uh, like, and, and other progressive measures such as literacy programs and so on. I mean, they also made many, many mistakes, but it was nevertheless a huge break with the past that Af Afghanistan had, had endured. Um, and the regime immediately fell in, under the, in the sphere of influence of the Soviet Union. And the US, uh, the way that the Americans countered this was by basically have, uh, forming an alliance with the Saudi, uh, Saudis and the Pakistani um, uh, intelligence, again leaning on the most backward layers in Afghan society, the tribal uh, leaders, uh, clan leaders, the, the, the big landlords, and, you know, and forming what is called the dollar jihad, which is uh, the, the, the channeling of billions and billions of dollars into this, uh, this movement of the Mujahideen, which later on became the Taliban as, as we know it. Uh, I think the figure is $3.2 billion. Uh, billion. Uh, and a lot of this money would come from Saudi Arabia, who also would provide fighters, arms, and, and so on, and the CIA was kind of coordinating this whole thing. It's the last a war that lasted more than 10 years and, and eventually ended up with barbarism in, in, in Afghanistan. 
And I don't know if you remember, you know, they talk about Al Qaeda and all these people as, you know, these extremely evil people now. But back then, Osama bin Laden, you know, there's a very famous uh, article, interview of Robert Fisk with him. Funny enough, he's like the most anti-jihadi person now. But it was like a freedom fighter. That was, the, that was the, the, the title that they had with the picture of Osama bin Laden next to it. And um, I don't know if any of you guys remember it, but Rocky, no, what's it called? Um, Rambo. Rambo, which is an action film from, uh, from, from, from the 90s or 80s, was it? Is actually dedicated to the, to the Mujahideen, is dedicated to, to, to these people, to these animals. That was the West pushing it. Now, all of that is, of course, forgotten and no one really talks about it uh, anymore. Um, and of course, once the business was finished, the Taliban remained and became a headache for the Americans. But nevertheless, for them, the main point was the class questions, was the defense of the property rights of, cap of the capitalists uh, uh, and the ruling class in Afghanistan and elsewhere, because Afghanistan wasn't that important, but it was a model for other people to follow, uh, to expropriate the big landlords, the banks, and the capitalists, and to run society without uh, any private property. And this guy, Brzezinski, who was one of the main architects of this, they asked him recently in an interview, he said, you know, what, if, you know, what about what about all, everything that happened since? And he said, he said this, he said, what's important to the history of the world? The Taliban or the collapse of the Soviet Empire? Some stirred up Muslims or the liberation of cent Central Europe and the end of the Cold War? And this shows exactly the way that the Americans and, and, the, and the imperialists thought. But they, but they not, not only destabilized Afghanistan, they destabilized Pakistan. They also, in the same period, in 65, they supported uh, 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 in Indonesia, the massacre of one million communists by mainly uh, uh, Islamist-backed uh, groups and the Indonesian regime. In Palestine, the, 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 the liberation movement in Palestine against Israel was predominantly a left-wing movement. And it's, you know, it's, it's documented uh, uh, very much how the Israeli uh, and the Western intelligence agencies did everything they could, hounding down the the the, 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 the lefties, uh, uh, you know, blocking them at every single every chance they could, while allowing Hamas, the Muslim Brotherhood, to set up mosques to preach their stuff, to disseminate, basically because they knew that the, the Islamists, while they might be a headache, they weren't a fundamental threat to the fundamental interests, i.e., of capitalism, and they couldn't in any way appeal to the Israeli working class, which is what the, the Israeli regime is terrified of, that the Israeli working class somehow would turn against the, the state itself. Um, if we come up a bit closer to today, in Iraq, before the Iraq war, there wasn't any, there wasn't no, you can say what you want about Saddam Hussein, and he certainly wasn't a pleasant man, but there wasn't Al-Qaeda. And the form of sectarianism that we see today was nowhere to be seen uh, in Iraq. In fact, the main traditions in Iraq uh, were leftist, again, communist, leftist, Arab nationalist uh, traditions, and also the Kurds had leftist uh, traditions in Iraq. Um, but after the Iraq war, in order to dominate, in order to control the, the, the country, the, you know, the Americans talked about winning the hearts and minds. But what did that actually mean in practice? That meant uh, uh, f uh, stirring up tribalism, sectarianism, playing out Sunnis and Shias and Kurds, who've been living together peacefully for centuries, we never had any any problem. You didn't ask what people were before before all of this. You might know, but it wasn't like a big, big thing. Uh, most Iraqis from like that generation, from the generation before me, they were mar marrying and mixing across all of these things. But the Americans pushing sectarianism, <coughs> pushing this form of uh, nationalism and tribalism, in order to fight down the anti-American uprisings uh, uh, and, and uh, fight that was, uh, that was uh, brewing, supported by the Saudis. And when the Arab Revolution came, this is, uh, this is even uh, more recently, the, the Arab Revolution also had a big impact in Iraq, there were huge demonstrations in, uh, in, the, in the East, sorry, in the West, where the Sunnis are based especially. Big, big mass mobilizations taking over squares, and they were non-sectarian, they were for democracy, for democratic rights, against sectarianism, against poverty, against inflation, against unemployment. But what did the Saudis and the Gulf states, supported by the Americans, do? They poured in billions and billions of dollars supporting especially tribal forces, but also uh, these sectarian uh, 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 Islamist uh, forces. 
which later on fed into the development of ISIS uh, as we know it and, and reinvigorated uh, um, Al Qaeda. Um, in Syria, we had the same thing. You had, uh, first of all, obviously the Syrian revolution was a genuine revolution to, to, to begin with. But because of things that we can't really discuss now, it, it met, it went into an impasse. And that allowed the counter revolution to step in again with the scourge of, scourge of, of uh, sectarianism. The Assad regime. Uh, opened up the, uh, the, the prisons, released all the, uh, the jihadis in order to push them, in order to, to actually polarize the society on a sectarian basis and to prove, look, this is what the Americans and, and the West are going to do. They want to, they want to, uh, to destroy Syria and they supported the jihadis and so on. And of course, that is exactly what the Americans and, and, the, and the others were, were trying to do. Um, in fact, the, the campaign in Syria was the biggest campaign in the budget of the CIA and the groups that they supported, that you know, the so-called freedom fighters and moderates, as soon as you went in to look who, who they actually were, they were all uh, uh, Islamists of one kind or another and they were being radicalized, radicalized more and more in this, uh, this, uh, this, this, rev in this, in this sectarian civil war, uh, eventually ended up being two main groups, which were ISIS and Jabhat al-Nusra or, or Al-Qaeda. And all the other ones were dominated by these two. There was nothing, there was no moderate groups. They were too tiny to operate alone. They could be switched off like this, but they were kept alive, especially by, by Al-Qaeda, in order to, to have like a front where they could receive money from, from, from the West and so on. And what was the main reasons for this? On the one hand, it was to, for in, the, in the geostrategical game that these people are playing against each other, the Saudis and the Israelis, the Americans against the Iranians, but at the same time, it was to cut across the Arab Revolution and use it as an example throughout the region, which they are doing every, every single day, to say, this is what happens when you go onto the streets. This is what happens. You know, some of our comrades in Morocco were saying, people on the streets are saying, Alhamdulillah, we, we didn't go that far. We didn't do what the Syrians did, because we don't want our country to end up like that. And that was the main purpose of, uh, of carrying out that counter-revolution as, as it happened. And in doing so, again, they were leaning on what? Not on the urban uh, uh, working, working classes. In fact, the working class in Syria was not really involved in, in, the, in the movement as a class, but mainly on tribal, rural, backward uh, uh, layers. And at, at the same time, also a layer of European youth who has been, who's been radicalized by the you know, constant racism and harassment every single day that goes on in the media, which is supported by the unions, which is not really, you know, and supported even by the, by the left wing and the workers' parties. We're not saying anything to, to this. Just buying into it. Um, and um, that was the, the, the main kind of bulwark of, of reaction against the, 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 the Arab revolution that, that, the, that the imperialists and the, the local ruling classes could uh, foster. They did the same thing in Libya which is now in a, in a, in a complete state of, uh, of, of, of barbarism. In Yemen, you see, you say, they say, oh yeah, we're fighting against the Houthis. The Houthis, you can say whatever they, you want, they're certainly not progressive people, they're extremely barbaric, reactionary, but they have some sort of support. But who is it that, they, that the Saudi, um, the Saudi attack on, uh, on uh, Yemen is, is leaning on? It's on Al-Qaeda in the Arab Peninsula, it's on Al-Qaeda in Yemen. All forms of, of, of Islamist types, they're even importing Islamists from, from Sudan and, and, and elsewhere because they can't fight their own struggle. Um, now, I'm going to sum up in a minute, but just there's one more factor in this whole thing is uh, the, the, the crisis of capitalism is basically the driving force of, of Islamism and of, of the imperialists supporting this because they cannot solve the basic daily day needs of the Arab masses on the basis of capitalist society. Therefore, they, they cannot afford the smallest uh, concessions, and they're forced to fight against it. But there's another, there's another uh, element as well in the Middle East, which is uh, Saudi Arabia, which is in, a, in an existential crisis. As I said before, this is, a, this is not a real nation. No one, I mean, people would say I'm Saudis, but there's not like a, you know, the whole country is named after one family. No one feels this is my nation, I'm going to fight to the death. The Saudi army has never been in war, it's a puppet army. Because the people who, pe people wouldn't necessarily die for a crown prince or a king 
who is, you know, who lives this extremely disgusting, you know, lavish lifestyle, whereas the vast majority of Saudis, in fact, live in poverty. You know, Saudi Arabia is not that like the Gulf states where everyone, you know, are, are rich. There's a huge number of poor people. Uh, on the one hand, 20% of the population are Shia, extremely oppressed, extremely poor, hate the regime. Then there's the youth and everything living and progressive, which is against this dictatorship, the authoritarianism, the hypocrisy of in society. Women are also against the regime. Then you have obviously the poor who are not getting anything out of, out of, out of this society. Then you have the, the Wahhabis and the extremists who also hate the, hate the monarchy just from, the, from, from a right-wing point of view. And so there's no one actually in defense of this, of, this, of this country. And this country, this nation could survive as long as it was supported by the imperialists and as long as oil prices were high as long as the economy was booming, it could pay off. It would basically pay itself out of, of, um, of you know, of social tensions. Um, but as the crisis of capitalism has at oil prices uh, fall, you you begin to see, for instance, Saudi Arabia had the first budget deficit. What does that mean? That means it cannot buy off uh, its network of patronage, <laughs> basically. It cannot buy off the, the the jihadis. It cannot buy off the the, the working class. Um, and also, it's not as, as important from the point of view of imperialists anymore. The Americans are now self-sufficient in oil. Saudi oil is still important, but the Americans don't need Saudi Arabia like they did in the 80s, where they got 90% of their oil from, 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 from the Gulf. Um, and the way that the Saudis have been acting in the Middle East, for instance, has also at times brought, brought them into clashing with US imperialism itself. For instance, in Syria, where the Americans at one point said, okay, uh, you know, we shouldn't support these groups anymore because now they're just spinning out of control and the Saudis kept doing it, basically provoking, provoking the Americans. So in that sense, the basis for Saudi Arabia is gradually being eroded and there's no, there's no one who is actually going to stand up and, and, and defend it, which is why it's lashing out, which is why the kingdom is lashing out, sending out these troops so, sorry, sending out these, uh, these, uh, these, these groups and supporting <coughs> counter-revolution in one country after another, basically trying to keep all these plates spinning in order to divert attention from, the, the, from its own uh, uh, crisis. But sooner or later, all of this is going to come back, obviously. And uh, I think, well, the days of, of Saudi Arabia are, are, are numbered. One way or another, it, it's not going to be what, what it is today. Um, so just to sum up, Islamic fundamentalism, uh, as we know it today, is nothing but pure counter-revolution. It has nothing to do with ordinary Muslims in the Middle East, who in fact, if you want anything, the traditional political uh, trend that they would have is leftist, is socialist, is, 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 is communist. In the 60s and 70s and 80s, you had millions of communists in Iran, in Iraq, in Sudan, each of these countries you had millions, not just as, as, a, as a total. In Egypt, obviously, there was the Arab nationalist trend. The same was, the same was in, in, uh, in Syria, in Libya, uh, in uh, Algeria, in Tunisia, all of these countries. The main trend of the masses was a left-wing uh, 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 trend. And the, uh, the, um, the Islamists were the pure counter-revolution who could never actually achieve a mass space on their own without the support of, of the imperialists. They, it's a reflection of the blind rage and impotence of the, the petty bourgeoisie, the tribal uh, uh, layers, the, the most primitive, and also the lumpens, the ones who have been completely dispossessed by the wars and havoc and destruction that the imperialists have caused. Uh, they're downtrodden by the imperialists, but they're not finding a lead in the working class. And that's the main thing, that they're not finding a lead, a socialist lead from the working class as it is. As I said, independently, they're extremely weak, but they find somehow common cause with the imperialists. They're extremely hypocritical because they always go on about how anti-imperialist they are, but in the end, they always end up on the same side fighting the struggles of the imperialists, like, uh, like uh, uh, you know, the, 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 what do you call it, mercenaries. Um, and, and what it really shows is a complete dead end of capitalism. As I said, capitalism in Europe came to power fighting against ob obscurantism, fighting against religious fanaticism. But in the Middle East, it's the exact opposite. It's, it's actually leaning on these layers. Some of these like, tribes, this is something that belongs to 
periods way, way, way before uh, uh, you know the capitalist uh, developments. Um, and for all the radical talk, the Islamists don't touch capitalism uh, at, at all, or even fight, as I said, uh, imperialism. Their role is to cut, a cl cut across the class contradictions in society, and they can only gain when the working class is retreating. You see, when the Egyptian revolution was moving forward, the slogan was, we're all Egyptians. You know, do you remember there was, people were forming a, Christians were forming a ring around the Muslims who were, uh, who were, who were praying. That's class solidarity. Uh, uh, and in, in Syria, it was the same thing. The main slogan when the revolution was moving forward was, we're all Syrians, right? But uh, now that's changed. As the revolution met one obstacle after another because of its own mistakes, because it wasn't able to take power, and it was, it, it was forced to retreat, in that vacuum, you saw the development of these reactionary layers of uh, these reactionary groups tapping into the most backward layers who, uh, 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 and using them basically as cannon fodder for their own, uh, for their own ends. Um, so <clears throat> the only way to approach this thing is on a class basis, in, in my opinion. The way to fight against Islamic fundamentalism, the fight against Islamic fundamentalism and the fight against imperialism and the fight against capitalism <coughs> cannot be separated. The fight for the liberation of the Middle East for democracy uh, cannot be separated from, from this fight and for the from the struggle for socialism. Uh, now, that is something that the, that the Middle Eastern masses will have to learn themselves through their painful struggles. But I'm confident that just like we saw this enormous mass movements in the previous, in the post-war period, moving sharply to the left, that those traditions are and will be uh, uh, re revived and reignited um, and the masses will, will, will understand that the only way to o overcome the barbarism and the backwardness that prevails in the region is to take power in their own hands and to, to, to overthrow the capitalist system. <clears throat>